It's the Afternoon Edition Extra podcast with Nahal and Sarah. And, do you know, one of the guys that you're going to hear from now, I went out into the corridor during the news and said to him, I've been involved in many, many years of radio, but that was one of the most powerful hours of radio that I have ever been involved in. And that's why we've made a special podcast on this today, because we were talking about male domestic violence. And we started off the hour by hearing a woman tell us why she abused her ex-partner, something that led to many of our listeners getting in contact with say they'd never heard that voice before. So over to you. Listen to it. What do you think? There are currently calls for more safe houses to support male victims of domestic abuse. There's just 70 spaces available around the UK right now. And just 24 of them are reserved for men only. None of them are in London. The latest Office for National Statistics figures suggests 4.4% of men experienced domestic abuse last year. That's the equivalent of 706,000 men. For comparison, 7.7% of women say they were a victim of domestic abuse over the same period. Male victims are more than three times as likely as women to keep their abuse secret. But you'll hear some men tell this programme that when they do find the courage to reach out, they don't always know where to turn for support. And some have even told us that they felt that the police didn't take them seriously or offer them the protection they felt that they needed. So we're asking, is domestic abuse abuse against men taken seriously enough? It's 0500 909 693 as always, 85058. The lines are open now and at BBC Five Live on social media. We're going to hear from men who have experienced domestic abuse, including one man who says being with his ex-partner was like being held in captivity. She once assaulted him so badly he had to spend 11 hours in A&E being treated for his injuries. But there is another side to this story. Stopping male domestic abuse is not just about supporting victims, although that is, of course, very important indeed. It's also about helping abusers to stop, to not repeat what they have done in the past. So we wanted to bring you a different perspective, something you might not have heard before. Florence became an anger management specialist after needing anger management herself because of her violence to her then partner. Florence, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon on Five Live. Hello. Um, Florence, when were you first violent towards your former partner and why? It was back in 1994 that I was first violent and it was then a a one-off episode or I thought it was and I wasn't violent, violent again for over a year. And I noticed that I've not answered your question about why. I'm not entirely clear about why. Um, I got enraged and I, and I hit. I mean, after the first incident, oh, actually, no, after the second incident, how did you both respond and behave? You start with you. How did you react to it? Well, I, after I hit him the first time, I this, was absolutely yeah. shocked right. and horrified and appalled at what I'd done. And in a way, I brushed it under the carpet and forgot about it because it was obviously so clearly unacceptable. It wasn't going to happen again. So the second time was more shocking and I was more frightened and appalled because I'd done it again. So that made me more frightened about whether I would do it again. How many times did it happen, Florence? So I didn't seek help and go to anger management until 2004 and so it was a 10-year period and during that time, as I say, it was probably about a year between the first and second time and maybe it was six months between the next time but then it became more frequent so by the end it was every three, four, six months I would say. And how did your partner react when it happened? He reacted in different ways at different times. Um, My reaction was always to be shocked at what I'd done, sorry about what I'd done. And I began by saying, I'm sorry, and it won't happen again. And then I got to the point when I said, I'm sorry, 
and it looks as though it will happen again because I don't seem to be able to stop it. And I felt scared and and powerless, and I didn't know where to turn. You talked before about people taking the courage to men who are the victims needing to take courage and then to talk about and then not knowing where to turn. I found it very, very difficult to have the courage to look for help. And then when I did find the courage, I didn't know where to turn. And when I started looking, I found places that would be helping men rather than helping women. Did you tell Florence any of your friends... No, I was too ashamed. Right. And how violent did it get? Was it purely verbal? No, it it didn't stop a verbal. I was physically violent as well. You can tell I'm not very comfortable talking about the detail. Even though it's so long ago and even though I've talked about it before, I still feel ashamed talking about it and looking back. Mm Mm-hmm. And you felt that there was no support for you, but presumably he had no support as a a victim. When you say he had no support, he didn't seek support either. We were both caught in the vicious cycle together. Why do you think he didn't seek support? I think he didn't seek support because he was ashamed I think he didn't seek support because he wasn't, he thought I wasn't hurting him. And of course I was hurting him emotionally and physically at times. But I don't think he took it seriously enough to seek support for himself. Florence, when you look back, were there any patterns of behaviour in the build-up that suggested that this was going to happen? So in terms of... There's patterns physically and um, of behaviour. Anger management was so powerful for me because it helped me learn that actually my body told me when I was getting angry and therefore that if I observed those warning signs, then I could not be aggressive, which was fantastic. In terms of behaviour, I would say that absolutely I was a critical person my thinking was very black and white. It was, I had firm views on how I should behave, how he should behave. I would exaggerate, so always never talk. And that's something as well that myself and when I'm teaching anger management, I help people to look out for the things, the early warning signs, the things that they're saying and doing that are flags that say you're getting angry. Mm-hmm. You need to stop. Have you identified what your triggers were? So I had lots of triggers, and it's um, a a broad and very personal topic to be talking about. Um, And part of my triggers, main triggers, were unhealed wounds from childhood. And I've had counselling and psychotherapy, which has been immensely helpful. Other triggers were ignoring um, the things in the relationship which weren't working for me. I was so focused on the fact that I was behaving badly that I didn't take seriously the fact the relationship wasn't working. And I left the relationship six years ago, and that's one thing that's helped me. Um, Florence, um, when I've done phone-ins about domestic violence before, and it has been women who have been the victims, and I've heard from a number of women before who've called in and said that um, the man they were with never changed. However many times he said he would, he didn't. Do you think now you are someone who could never abuse someone again? Whoa, that's a very big statement, could never abuse someone again. Um, And I am absolutely clear that I have changed. Um, and there's a, I wanted to change. So I, my behavior was never acceptable. I wanted to get help. I sought help. And then I have been rigorous about con- putting into, a, putting in place what I have learned. 
So I am confident that now I look after myself. I take sensible decisions in my life, which means people around me are safe and have nothing to fear. Do you think that there are more women like you out there that have done this, um, but for whatever reason they haven't or their partners haven't come forward? Is oh, it- huge numbers. Since I spoke about what I had done and a major reason for speaking about it was because I hadn't sought help because of my shame and I hoped that it would help other people to seek help. I have worked with a lot of aggressive, verbally aggressive and physically aggressive women who haven't told anybody because they've been ashamed. Um, Florence, um, a little while ago I interviewed a woman who had been a victim um, of a terrible attack by a man and he would constantly say to her about his childhood and how difficult it was and she wanted to fix him, she wanted to help him. So she stayed with him until she realised actually that he had a choice and he made a choice to abuse her. And what would you say to someone who said, well, actually, you made a choice to do the things that you did and there is no justification for what you did? I would say that in that moment of violence, I did not feel I had a choice. I would say that I was full of the fight hormones and that I was acting on automatic pilot and I did have a choice about going to anger management. So my behaviour now is my choice. Does that make sense? So I have now got help so that I'm able to control myself. So I'm not excusing my past behaviour. Um, what am I trying to say? We're getting a number of texts talking about mental cruelty as well, Florence, about mm. psychological abuse. Mm. So it doesn't always take a physical sense. Would you say that you were guilty of that as well? 100%, yes. To try and erode his confidence? I wasn't trying to erode his confidence and um, I wouldn't be surprised if that had been the effect of it. What do you think it was about? Do you think some people say it's about control? Domination. So, I think that without doubt I was trying to get what I wanted through the way I spoke and I acted and that is about control, isn't it? Um, and that control, and again, I'm not saying this to excuse my behaviour, but the level of that need to control was about my pain and the number of things that weren't working in my present and my pain from my past. And it didn't help that I shamed myself and told myself that I shouldn't be doing that and all this stuff about choice and control. What helped was when I started to recognise, you need help, Florence, and when I got myself help. If there's a woman listening out there that this is resonating with her, but she might not even think that she has a problem, what would you say? Well, that's very difficult. If people, we can't make people realise they've got a problem. Um, If somebody, if it resonates with them and they know they've got a problem, then I hope that they will get over their shame and seek help. And and I, I would say that I don't agree with them if they don't think they've got a problem. I think that verbal violence is abusive and that physical violence, unless it's in self-defense, is aggressive and abusive. Thank you very much for talking to us on the programme, Florence. Much appreciated. Mm, well, lots of texts going Florence, in Florence, who became a, an anger management specialist after needing the treatment herself because of the violence to her then partner, as you heard about. 85058 0500 909 693. Um, this text is coming soon. It's amazing how Florence is betraying herself and being treated as a victim. She's even blaming her partner for not seeking support and being allowed to. A male abuser would never be interviewed like this. Such double standards. 
Uh, Ali on Twitter said, groundbreaking radio on BBC Five Live now. Honest interview with a female domestic abuser. David Manchester said, you really need to focus on mental cruelty to men, not the more narrow area of violence. This mental aspect is recognised in all the legislation around divorce, etc. I think a lot of men suffer unacceptable levels of mental cruelty, which needs to be exposed so people know what it is and what is not acceptable. Mark Brooks runs the charity Mankind Initiative. Oliver was attacked on multiple occasions by an ex-girlfriend. He wants to train to be a police officer to help other victims of domestic abuse. And Ian was abused by his ex-partner. She spent three and a half years in jail after being found guilty of GBH with intent and four counts of causing actual bodily harm. Ian, can I ask you to start with what you make of what Florence had to say there? How did you feel listening to her? Well, I could certainly um, re relate to aspects in my ex-partner's personality, but, but I think the headline for me is that Abuse is abuse and it has many forms, physical and, and emotional. And whilst I accept that some of the choices that the previous caller has made and there are influences, you do have that within you to recognise that this is wrong and, and she actually accepted that. Therefore, there is a choice to change where the self-help and perpetrators have to take more responsibility. Tell us about what happened to you, Ian. So the, just to put into context, um, three decades of lifestyle and career planning were undone in 14 months. I lost my business, I lost my home, I was registered disabled, I've got permanent scarring. The physical side was really very severe. I had cigarettes were lit and put up my nostrils, I had to extract them with a tweezer. I had a kettle of water, was boiled and poured over me twice, back to back. And what would ultimately send my partner to prison was um, branding me with a red hot iron three times on my lower left forearm, my upper shoulder and between my shoulder blades. And the psychological abuse took me to the point where the only escape for me was suicide. And I felt really excited about that, regaining control. How many years did you endure this? Uh, 14 months. So in just 14 months, almost three decades of my life was undone. 14 months? 14 months. All of that abuse in Absolutely. 14 months? Yeah. It was, it was horrific, and as I say, it's a psychological side. Imagine as uh, many men listening, you look in the mirror, you don't want to look in the mirror to get a shave or brush your teeth because you've got one eye permanently closed, your nose is fractured, your cheekbones are swollen, you're covered in bruises, so you learn to shave and brush your teeth without seeing your own reflection because you really don't like what's coming back. Ian, people who... Are abusers don't go from zero to violent overnight, do they? So what were the early signs that this woman had these traits? In, in my specific case, there were no signs at all. And in fact, the first assault, I was whacked across the face with a pipe while she was hoovering and split my cheekbone. So it was really severe. And that would infer there had perhaps been previous instances, but not with me. So as is a question often asked of women, why didn't you leave at that point? And it's a really important question. When, when I look back at the first six months, I would say that my partner groomed me. And, and what I mean by that is she established trust. She then manipulated that trust and manipulated relationships with friends and family members. And at the point of knowing she had me isolated, that's when the violence started. It was a conscious strategy to isolate me and gain control and what did that do to your not self-confidence because it's obvious what it would have done to your self-confidence but to your sense of being a man sure as well as not just as a man but as a human to wake up knowing that today will be like yesterday and tomorrow will be the same as today and you have no control ultimately you are ground down it's the, the Mental energy is sapped from you, like quickly draining a battery. And so you go into silent mode. You only speak when you're spoken to, till eventually the excitement is, I can take my own life. I can choose to die by taking tablets rather than have my life beaten out of me with a hammer, which is ultimately what happened in the final assault. She attacked you with a hammer? Yeah, t to such an extent the hammer actually broke. I've got a souvenir of that hammerhead. In my left shoulder, there's a permanent indentation. Fractured my skull, fractured my cheekbones, fractured my ribs. Were your friends aware 
of what was going on? No, I, um, oh. I travelled around with work and what had happened as a process of manipulation is that my partner had contacted them to say that I wanted money back that I'd lent to them. And of course, I never had. There's an example of the level of manipulation. So the calls gradually reduced and then eventually stopped. When you are being attacked with such ferocity, what are you thinking about? Um, firstly, you're in shock. Then it's, where will this stop? This, this white line that you know you cannot cross has suddenly been crossed and you don't know where the barrier is. So you say nothing, you do nothing, you're looking into the eye of a storm, and inevitably the pattern was, when I dispersed blood from my mouth, my nose, my eye, wherever, that was the trigger to stop, as if there was some satisfaction. But then no futile apology. I was actually sent out almost immediately to buy cigarettes as if there was some pride in, look what I've caused, look at the state of this man's face. And the mobile phone was in my right hand and my partner would call me off the house phone so I wasn't even able to speak to anybody. That was the level of control. I was the TV, my partner had the remote control. How did you escape? I was very lucky in that the final assault in which my partner said she was going to kill me followed the same trait but someone in the neighbourhood saw the quite appalling state that I was in. And by this time, I'd lost 25% of my body weight. And someone in the neighbourhood went to the police anonymously and the police came to the property. And when they came round, what happened? Well, I have to say there's um, a positive and a negative. The, the officers that came were very quick to separate both me and my ex-partner. They removed me from the property into the safety of a police van. But then quite astonishingly, given that we were not married and no children and I was a sole house owner, my partner was bailed back to my house and I had to take civil action in the courts to extradite her from my own property. That simply would not have happened if the genders were reversed. Right, so throughout the course of you being abused like this, had you ever gone to the police? No, my, my movements... At, were so that, controlled? So controlled. Right. When I woke, when I went to sleep, everything. I was, I was a hermit and a robot, is the best way to describe it. It wasn't even in it, barely in existence. So I, I'm, I hope I'm not putting words into your mouth here, but the way you were treated by the legal system, you feel you were treated There's, differently because you were a man. Yes, and I think first and foremost, and a big part of my own recovery, is that I saw myself as a victim. However, for the police, to, the police to lead me in a night shelter for homeless. They accompanied me to the hospital where I remained for eight hours, fractured skull, etc. Yet staggeringly left me in a night shelter for the homeless and I thought I was in a refuge. And I wake up the next morning knowing I'm being pursued. I'm convinced I'm going to be killed. And then I remained in Salvation Army accommodation for 18 months. 18 months. Were you physically stronger than her? When I met my partner, almost six foot and 13 and a half stone, my partner was five foot one and seven stone. So there's the power of psychology. Mentally, she had complete control. And you never hit her? Never, ever. And there's two things. One, it's wrong, it's not acceptable. Any attempt to restrain, if someone can pour a kettle on you when you say or do nothing, you attempt to restrain, your view is, I comply and hope it blows out. If I try to restrain, I'm going to be killed. So which one would you do? Ian, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I know that you're going to stay for the next half hour. Um, thank you. But it's, it, it's safe to say it's an extraordinary testimony and thank you very much for being brave enough to come and talk to us about it. In a moment, I'm going to speak to Mark Brooks, who runs the charity Mankind Initiative, and also Oliver, who was attacked on multiple occasions by an ex-girlfriend. Uh, but Before that, a text from someone who's potentially had an empathy bypass operation, a very successful one. Because this text said, I have no sympathy for any of your callers. They only have themselves to blame. Someone who's going to sit there while the other burns them with a cigarette or water, more fool them. Ian, would you like to react to that? Because it's not the only text in that vein. Uh, why didn't this chap physically stop his partner hitting him? And also from Chris in Wakefield, who's actually, it's not a criticism and he says that. I feel sorry for these men, but I'm struggling to understand why they can't physically stand up for themselves. Now, I know you have answered that question already, but if you want to reiterate it and perhaps 
dig a little bit deeper into it, just to yeah. allow some of these men sure. to understand. And I think that's why today's programme is so important yeah. to, to raise, reach out to people who actually are very honest and say, I, I don't understand as a man why you would put up with that. The, the, the psychological control and the level of control on your life by the perpetrator means that ultimately you only ever feel as though you have two choices. Comply, run the risk of being killed. So difficult as it may sound, if someone said to you, you can stay in this house and you can try and manage the violence, or you can try and leave, knowing for certain you will be killed, there's a stark choice. Which one are you going to make? You're going to stay and try to manage your own sense of risk, try to control the situation, but it's futile. So do you think wherever you went, she would find you? Without a shadow of a doubt. I, I, I would have been killed had I made any attempt to leave. I have no are, doubt about that. There are so many female victims of domestic violence that say exactly yep. the same thing. The sheer abject terror of leaving because yep. they thought that would definitely be yep. the end of them if they did. But it some, says something, in, doesn't it, to the, the power of the stigma out there about male victims of, of domestic violence that people still are like, I don't get it, I don't get it. And I understand why you don't get it, but now Hal and I were talking about this before... We came on air and and Hal said a really interesting thing. He said, think about a man hitting a woman. Does that make you angry? And I said, yes. And he said, now think about a woman hitting a man. Does that make you angry? And I was like, yes, it does, but not in the same way. It's not the same. And that's my own prejudice. I freely admit it. But that's, that's where you're at. Like, that's kind of... That's the, the, the level of, of how... It comes down to the heart of our question about how, whether it's taken seriously. I know. Yeah. So let's yeah. talk to Oliver as well and to Mark. Uh, Mark Brooks running the charity Mankind Initiative and Oliver attacked on multiple occasions by a next girlfriend. Mark, because this is your field of total expertise, just kind of give us a bit of a reaction to what you've been hearing for the last half hour from Florence to Ian and, and where we are with this subject. Well, well I've, I think with regard to Florence, I, I would really like to you know, thank her for coming forward and, and speaking so openly because what we find in the work that we do, uh, supporting victims and also helping other organisations like the police or the health service or, or local authorities, is that they can't quite understand how a woman could actually be a perpetrator of domestic abuse. Um, they don't, um, it's not on their, uh, part of their kind of societal belief system, i.e. it's not something that they ever recognise could possibly happen. And, you know, what Florence has done has really opened up uh, the conversation and the understanding for all the listeners, but also for, for many people um, in the profession, in the domestic abuse profession, about how a woman could be an abuser. And I have to say, you know, one of the people who texted in to say this was a groundbreaking interview, I, I have to wholeheartedly agree with them. In terms of um, what Ian described, and it is clear that there is a combination in an abusive relationship of both violence and psychological abuse. And, you know, for far too many men, um, they fear that they're alone. They fear that they're the only man this has ever happened in the whole world. Um, they don't understand what is actually happening to them. And also they fear that if they do come forward, that they'll be laughed at, they'll be further humiliated by people not taking them seriously. And that if they go to the police or anyone else, they'll actually, the blame for the situation will be put on them. And one of the callers we've, or texts we've just had shows that we still have a long, long way to go in society where we recognise that both women are victims of domestic abuse and men are too. And my last point is it really does show again, that we've some way to go to close the empathy gap between men and women when they're victims of uh, violence. And there's rightly so, plenty of empathy and understand for female victims and plenty of support, but there's still a gap with regard to the same approach and understanding for men in that same situation. Oliver, you were 21 years old when the abuse started with your ex-girlfriend. You'd been together for two years and then the first incident happened. What what did happen? Well, we were just having a night in our, our flat, 
and I, I, I dropped something to do with dinner. And next thing I know, I'm, I'm kind of staggering backwards as a hand has come off, come out and just caught me across the face. And this started, uh, kind of, that, that was the first instance. And I, I sat there and went, oh, <laughs> you know, it's a one-off. It was, it, it was a girl I was head over heels for, I was in love with. I, you know, I'd, I'd moved in with her and we had a, a, what I thought was a, a perfect relationship. And it was a one-off lashing out, I suppose, of, of anger. And instantly I just kind of went, oh, well, you know, it's, it's the first time, it's the last time. She was ridiculously apologetic. And I thought, oh, well, obviously it's just a, it's just a one-off. She, she's having a bad day. Let's just move on. And then the one-off became twice and another time and another time and another time and, and, and kind of... The, it, it got worse. It, it stopped being a slap. It was a punch, and then it was a kick, and then it was throwing a bowl full of pasta at me, and then it was, you know, a coffee mug, and, and then this and this and this, and kind of it, it expanded and it got worse and worse. And, and I'm, I'm lucky to say I, n- I never kind of had the same level of violence that Ian did. I mean, I, I was sat listening to Ian's interview just shocked and appalled and, and and it's it's really difficult to talk about something that that happens because I'm I mean I'm I'm a, I'm a big lad you know you, you, that text you got a little while ago so how can anyone let this happen to them I'm I'm a big lad I'm six foot four I weigh you know 18 stone I'm I'm a, a, a big physical rugby player I'm, I'm trying to be a police officer and I was terrified not because I couldn't defend myself because I wouldn't, because I refused to become part of the problem. I refused to raise my hand to someone else because at that point I would be no better than, than she was. Mm. You had a line that you would not yeah. cross. Yeah. I, I refused to cross that my, the yeah. my, I don't know, call it honour, call it integrity, call it stupidity if you really want to, well, that mm, said mm. I, will, I will not raise my hand to another person. Well, Stuart in, Stuart in Doncaster, Oliver, has said exactly that on the text. I totally empathise, but also think proper men are brought up to respect and never hit a woman. It's therefore exactly. difficult to respond physically to violence from a woman, which is a psychological barrier to dealing with it. Um, Oliver, I mean, could you tell any of your friends that this was happening? No, I, I, was, I was ashamed, and that's a horrible thing to say. Um, but I was completely and utterly ashamed. I thought, oh my God, this, this shouldn't be happening to someone like me. My friends are going to look at me. They're going to laugh. They're going to they're going to take the mick out of me. It's going to be it's going to be more humiliating than just sitting here and and taking it to to go to my friends, to go to the people I I played with and say look, this is happening to me. And so I was turning up to rugby matches already bruised and battered and just saying, oh well, it's from last week or it's from it's from training or it's from this that and the other or oh, oh, that. I, I think I came up with every excuse in the book. Oh, I banged my head on the uh, the cupboard. Um, you know, I hit my head with the car door. Uh, you know, I trapped my hand in a car door. I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm pretty sure my friends thought I was one of the clumsiest people on the planet. But it's not just the physical, is it, Oliver? I mean, no. Ian talked about losing 25% of his body weight, but surely they noticed differences in who you were, not how you looked. Because you you can't just keep the front up that you're the same Oliver, can you? If you're going through that kind of, I think I managed it. I think right. the way the, the way I did it, I was uh, I, a lot like I would I would excuse myself from situations, so I would kind of I would spend time with them very little. I would spend very little time with people. I would um, keep up the front uh, of being happy, jokey, really confident, but. It was it was the little things. So, you know, I I didn't like being in big rooms. I didn't like being with big groups of people. I I didn't like um, being in a crowd. I, I, I it was it was little things like that that before never bothered me. And um, something ridiculous, lifts, lifts terrified me because uh, at, at our at where, where where me and my partner used to live, we lived on a on a twelfth floor. And she would hit me in the lift. Um, and, and from then on, lifts terrified me. And I, I just couldn't, I couldn't go into lifts and, and crowds and that sort of thing. And it was little things that now I look back at and I go, that's a big difference. 
but at the time you you don't notice you you're so isolated you're so stuck in in a box i think is the best way to describe it and everything is suffocating you and everything is just just pulls you down it's like having a, a, a weight carrying weights around with you constantly it, it's 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 not a nice feeling it's it's like have been tied up inside and having that, that sense of, of just foreboding constantly, knowing, oh, God, I've got to go home. Oliver, I hope she's in a good mood. Oliver, it was eventually noticed, wasn't it, by a sports coach? And when yes. you When you then went forward, were people supportive? Did you get the help you need? Were you believed? Yes. What happened? Um, so I, I was... I was at a, at a rugby match, um, I was getting changed before the match and someone slapped me on the side and I ended up pretty much on the floor because I had um, broken ribs. And uh, at this point, my coach, who'd kind of been keeping an eye on me, um, said, look, you've, but I don't know what's the matter, but you need to tell me now. We need to talk about this because this is something that, that this is this is not rugby. This is not your other sports that you're doing. This is not your training. This is this is something particular. Uh, particular is happening to you, and you need to tell us about it. And eventually, I did. And at that point, it was. It, I mean, it sounds it sounds kind of cliche, but it was though a weight was lifted. Um, and I, I told my coach, and I told my father, and I told um, kind of two or three of the lads that I played rugby with, and I expected them. Like I say, I expected them to laugh at me. And it, it wasn't there was there was support there instantly that was right okay what can we do um, where, where right we need to get you out of the house you can come stay with me for a few weeks till you get somewhere to stay um, you know your partner's going my, my partner was going away uh, on a on a business trip the the next a, a few days later for a, for a weekend and I had six of my mates say right. The minute she goes, give us a call. We'll come round. We'll help you unpack your stuff, get your stuff sorted, and you can come stay with us for a few weeks. And that's what you did. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and it was it was just that minute of going, okay, I, I need help. I need I need someone to talk to. I need someone to to put their arm around me and say, look, mate, it's going to be okay. Oliver, thank you so much. Stay with us. We're going to talk as well to the Police and Crime Commissioner for Kent. It's Matthew Scott. And Matthew, I know you've been listening to this right from the top since one o'clock. It's an issue that you feel strongly about. Why? Well, I think that there are particular uh, issues here with regards to uh, there being a stigma. Uh, I think we've heard from uh, from both Oliver, Ian and, and also from Mark about the confidence that uh, men have to come forward and the seriousness with which their um, their allegations will be taken. And it's also, it's, it's a much more significant uh, proportion of domestic abuse calls that police receive. And I think people realise, um, I mean, in Kent, for example, uh, it makes up 18% of all the domestic abuse cases that we currently are dealing with here in Kent. Uh, but the crime survey for England and Wales estimates that it's anywhere uh, between 35 and 40%. So I think that there is a confidence issue we need to make sure that men feel confident to come forward. But also as PCCs, it's incumbent upon us to hold forces to account for their performance in this area and make sure we commission the services that people need. Um, Matthew, could you say hand on heart that the way Ian was treated would not happen again? Well, I, obviously, as I say, Ian spoke very bravely, I, I felt, about uh, his case. But I do think that there needs to be more awareness raised of this issue because cases like this are still going on. There are men out there who aren't coming forward. And there is clearly, because of the difference between the number of people who are coming forward and those who are victims, uh, that there is a confidence issue there that needs to be addressed. Mm. The confidence issue is around the fact that men don't feel like they'll be treated properly, that men don't feel that they'll be taken seriously. And, and, and that's absolutely right. And that's why I've made it a, a priority. I mean, domestic abuse and violence doesn't respect gender. It doesn't respect sexuality. Uh, and it takes many forms. It can be abuse. It can be violence. It can be psychological. And it was interesting to, uh, to, to hear Ian's comments uh, around uh, mental health uh, and suicide, because, of course, there are consequences for this. If people don't come forward, it does impact upon their mental health. Uh, and with suicide being uh, the biggest killer of men under the age uh, of 45, there can be very serious consequences consequences if, if support isn't there to help.
can I um, just read out some texts? Um, my job brings me into contact with male perpetrators and male victims of domestic assault. Regrettably, police training has created a positive gender bias towards women as the likely victim. There are large numbers of cases where men call the police to report assaults who are then themselves arrested. The most extreme case I've seen is of a stabbing of the male partner where... Him having called the police an ambulance, his uninjured partner told the police he had assaulted her. He was arrested in the ambulance. No weight was given to his explanation, which was treated as a defence to the allegations he faced, rather than a complaint in itself. Seems there's some way to go, Matthew, doesn't it? And, and I absolutely agree with that. And I think it's incumbent upon me as a police and crime commissioner and all of my colleagues across the country uh, to raise these issues with our police forces. We are ultimately responsible uh, for policing in our counties and holding our chief constables to account for the services that they receive. I do that here. I've been doing that uh, this morning uh, and making sure that men don't get any uh, less of a service uh, than women do. Ian, you're nodding in agreement. What did you want to say? Well, I think the important thing in the towns and cities is to do precisely that and to compare both a male and female at the same level of risk and the same situation, so single or with children, and to walk that journey in the shoes of those victims. So if they've got housing need, um, they've got need for emotional support, and we need to identify where those gaps, the disparity is, and address it with the identical appetite, as we would quite rightly if this was heterosexual against a same-sex victim. Ian, can I ask you, how are you now? Uh, very happy now. Very happy. What's your life like Can now? I say you're wearing a fantastic suit? Thank you. It is very a kind. singularly wonderful colour. Thank you. Which shows powerful. that you've, you've rebuilt your confidence. Well, just as a brief point on that, I made a conscious decision to choose those colours because the point I was going to make is, of course, there was a time in my life when those were the colours of my body and they were not of my choosing. Right. That's, and that's a powerful statement for me internally. You're wearing right. the colour of your colours. bruising. Yes, precisely. Precisely. Yeah. Um, Matthew, a text is coming, another one, um, uh, which is police-related. And it's from a police officer, a serving police officer. Says, I'm a male, six foot three, and a police officer. I've suffered years of abuse. And when I went to my employer, in fact, they arrested me on false allegations made by my abuser and continued the abuse on my abuser's behalf. After more than a year, these allegations were thrown out as false and malicious. Then an internal investigation showed I was innocent of all allegations. The police have been awful and continued the control of my abuser. Just listen to your afternoon phone in, left me in tears. Well, I'm very sorry to hear that that's the case, and I hope that uh, the, the force and their police and crime commissioner are supporting them in making sure that uh, he gets justice. I mean, and I've, I've heard this from people working not just in policing elsewhere, but this, uh, this assumption that you called it a, a positive gender bias, I believe, mm. uh, that uh, men will call up uh, to stop women calling up. And I think that there, there has to be more awareness uh, raised of it. I think it's an important part of, uh, mm. of police training that we make sure that domestic abuse and violence is treated the same, irrespective of gender. Oliver, uh, Ian is wearing purple suits and feeling much, much better about himself. How is your life now and what are you training to be? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to be a police officer. Um, my life currently is, <laughs> I don't want to say perfect, but I'm guessing it's getting as pretty close as it can be. Um, I, have a, I have a new lease on life and that sounds uh, ridiculous, but I am... More positive, I'm more open and more confident. I'm not afraid to talk about it. Um, I have a new partner who is supportive, who is loving of me, and who is is absolutely perfect. Um, and the reason, the reason I'm one of the reasons why I wanted to become a police officer is because I wanted to try and make that difference in the world. I wanted to make that difference in other people's lives. So if they come into contact with a police officer, they're not going to go through what Ian went through. And I understand that people are going to say, you know, you're just you're a small fish. You're one police officer. And yes, I'm one police officer. But if I'm one police officer affecting one person, then that's my life goal sorted. If I'm one person, if one police officer affecting one person, affecting one victim, then, you know, that's a start. And then maybe another police officer will see that and say, look, look what this guy's doing. Then that's two police officers affecting two people. And, you know, if you ask me where I want to be at the end of my career, uh, you know, I'd like to be, able to, and to be in a position where I can say we can make real effects and real changes across the board. And I'm good. And that's the best thing. I'm, I can walk down the street now. I can, you know, I can go into crowds. I can go into lifts. I can be make yourself. a real difference. Be I, can, and I, can, I can smile down the street, which is 
that's something I could do before. I salute thank you, you for so that, much. my friend. And Ian, thank you to Mark Brooks, also running Mankind, and to the Police Commissioner for Kent, Matthew Scott. And thank you all so much for all of your texts. Fantastic. Thanks very much. On digital and online. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. bbc.co.uk slash 5 Live.